Let's pray. And Father, we do again, thank you we can come here to worship you and praise you and acknowledge, Father, you are God, there is no other. Thank you for this time of year where we celebrate your giving us your son Jesus, his birth, uh, so that you can, you could, so you did, come and live among us as man without sin and yet die for our sin so we can have life. And we thank you, Father, for that greatest Christmas gift of all, which is you and your son Jesus. Pray bless this time this morning. Speak to us and encourage us. Open our eyes to you, are, open our minds, our hearts, our thoughts, our imagination, uh, to understand your text, Father, and to be drawn to you by your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Going through Matthew with the idea of how then shall we live, with the thought process of in our current culture, climate, situation we're in, where the world thinks they know who God is, they know who Jesus is, and they know how to explain Jesus, and they believe that whatever you think is okay as long as you say God exists, which of course is not true. So how are we to be a witness for Jesus in a world that says there is no sin, all good people go to heaven, etc., etc.? How are we able to be that witness, be that light, be that salt in a world that thinks they know Jesus when they don't? How are we to be that witness? In the text this morning, Matthew 18, Jesus actually answers that question pretty directly. And he says we are to live as children. We're to be as children, to be his followers and his servants. So we're going to approach that topic in chapter 18, verses 1 through 14. Beginning in verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before him, before them, and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as his child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of the Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. First, the context of this discussion. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The context of this discussion is the disciples' arrogance, pride, self-centeredness has began this discussion. Look at what they're saying. Which one of us can be greatest in your kingdom? That's just flat out pride, arrogance. It's like if you play the lottery, you already spend it before you get it, right? You got this plan, what you're going to do with it? Well, in their minds, Jesus is the king. He's going to send the king here in Jerusalem any day now. And when Jesus sets his kingdom up, they're having a place of authority in that kingdom. And they want to know which one of us is greatest among all of us in your kingdom once you set it up. That's nothing but pride, arrogance, self-centeredness. They are totally off base as a disciple of Jesus. Are they not? So the context of this discussion is, which one of us is the greatest? All about me. All about my arrogance and my pride. Now, so don't miss that. Uh, their, their question is not based on humbleness or Christ-likeness or wanting to serve Jesus. It's based on what's in it for me. Where am I going to rule for you? Where's my kingdom? Under your kingdom. All pride and arrogance. So when Jesus answers this question, 
He's addressing more than just the question. He's addressing their pride, their arrogance. He answers the question with three statements. One, to define salvation. One, to define greatness in heaven. And one, to emphasize the importance of children in God's kingdom. Which interests me that that comes here. An emphasis on children is in this discussion. Which seems out of place. Think about it. But it's not. So first, Jesus addresses salvation. Before they can even think about being great in his kingdom, they must be saved. Uh, so verse 3. He said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Two words here, converted and then become. The word converted also is, can be translated to turn. The important part here, though, it's in the passive voice, which means it receives the action. You would think when he says, unless you are converted, that would be me doing something to convert myself to be like this child, but that's not the case. It's passive, not active. Therefore, I receive the action. The conversion takes place to me. I receive the action of conversion, which means someone else converts me or turns me. Don't miss that. In every text in the Bible, when God calls us to turn, to change, it's always the passive, because I can't change who I am. Only God can change who I am. And he did that to the death of Jesus on the cross, his burial resurrection. I can't change the fact that I'm a sinner. Only God can change the fact that I'm a sinner. I have sinned. If I've only done one sin in my whole life, I'm a sinner. And I can't change the fact that I'm a sinner. Only Jesus, through his death and resurrection, can change the fact that I'm a sinner. So when I have to convert, I have to turn, that's God's action in my life. I'm receiving what he's doing and then turning and changing the fact that I'm no longer a sinner because of Jesus. And everything about my salvation and my sin-free life is in Jesus, not in me. Nothing I have done. Jesus made that happen. Then he says, convert, turn, and become like children. The word become is in the middle voice. There is no middle voice in English. There's no equivalent in English to the Greek middle voice. The middle voice is used to emphasize that I am taking part in the action. So the conversion, the turning, is Jesus working in my life. The becoming that child is my joining with Jesus in the action of changing who I am. Again, he makes it happen through his death and resurrection. All I can do is submit to that action and join with him in changing me. I said before, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he defines how a believer is to live. He defines what he's doing in my life. And it tells me what he's doing in my life so I can join with him to make it happen. He makes it happen, but I must surrender to that, submit to that, to join with him and allow him to change me. So convert and become is simply just defining salvation. Um, in Matthew 5, verses 3, 4, and 5, it's, it's the same principle. Jesus defines salvation, but more so in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. If you have anybody tell you it means physical poverty, turn around and walk away. Because you're wrong. It's nothing to do with money or, or physical material. It's poor in spirit. And what Jesus is saying is, I must have absolute, total poverty in spirit, acknowledge that poverty in spirit, before God. I have nothing I can offer God to cause him to change me. To want to change me, to want to love me or save me. I am totally in absolute poverty spiritually. I've got nothing to bring to God worthy of Him or worthy of Him to save me. I'm totally dependent on Him for my salvation. He must bring to the table that grace, that sacrifice, Jesus, His death to save me. And then in verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The idea is when I realize my spiritual poverty, I can do nothing to save me, to remove my sin, change the fact that I'm a sinner, that should cause me to mourn. That should bother me a little bit. I'm going to hell. It should also bother me a little bit that God had to execute his son to remove that sin in my life. So that mourning is for me as well as for what God had to do to save me. And then verse 5, let's show the meek, for they should inherit the earth. That word meek is also humble. In order for me to experience God's salvation, I must surrender myself to Him as God. Jesus as my Savior, and there is no other. 
and allow that to come into my life and change me. So Matthew 5, 3, 4, and 5 define salvation like Matthew 18, become like little children. It's that absolute total submission and surrender to Jesus as God and as Savior. There is no other. So when Jesus answers the question, who is greatest, he first defines salvation, which is based on what? Humility, submission, surrender to God. Nothing about power or strength or authority or greatness. It's humility. It's submission. The next part of the answer to the question is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And that word humble is in the active voice, which means I create the action. I actively work with Jesus to my humility, my submission, my surrender to him as a child does to his parents. So Jesus defines how we are to be great in heaven by saying you are to become like a little child. And when he talks about little child here, it's not like a 10-year-old, a 9-year-old. He says little ones. It's a toddler. Maybe they can walk at best. But the idea is not someone who can do things for themselves, but a child, a little one who can't do anything for himself. So take that word picture and let's run with it. As children, I am dependent on my parents for everything. When I brought my kids home, I didn't say, your room's over there, the fridge is over here, knock yourself out, you know, right? I had to dress them, change their diaper, feed them. They can't even burp on their own, right? You got to burp them. So that's the idea. I had to be that totally, absolutely dependent, submissive, surrendered to God, Jesus. That's my God, there is no other. Great word picture. So the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is someone who is like a child. All right, so am I reading this correctly? If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, act like a child. Brat, whiny, crybaby, you touched me, that's mine, you can't have it, selfish. Are we to be childish, to be great in God's kingdom? And of course, the answer is no. <laughs> so what is Jesus trying to communicate here? Uh, what are the things that we would admire in children that God wants us to imitate? We're going to be humble as a child. So what qualities is Jesus talking about? And think about that for a minute. Imitate the childlikeness of a child. Well, for one thing, a child wants to imitate his parents, does he not? And I have to imitate Jesus. That it says in the Bible, I have to imitate Jesus. Have the mind of Christ. Um, one of my kids, well, he's not here, so I can say, it was Jonathan. He was maybe 18 months, maybe two. He's able to talk, get words out of his mouth. And we were doing something, and something he wanted to do didn't work. And he turns around, puts his hand on the table, and goes, oh, shoot. <laughs> Where did he learn that from? He learned that from me. If I had used any other word, he would use the other word, too. Well, that's a child. They imitate their parents. God wants me to imitate Jesus. Jesus became man, just like I am man, all the temptation, weaknesses, everything, to communicate to me how I, as man, and to relate to God as God. When Jesus prayed, he prayed, Father. He didn't pray himself. He's showing me how to pray to the Father in Jesus' name, but I'm praying to the Father. So everything about Jesus as man is to show me how to be man, surrendered, God's child. I need to imitate him. Also with children, they have blind faith. They trust their parents without question. Now, when they get older, they may be why or what or et cetera, et cetera. But that's not really questioning their parents as it is wanting to get knowledge. They want to know. They're not questioning you and your authority or your place as parent. They just want to, they're expanding their brain looking for knowledge. But children blindly trust their parents. And they will do that into their teens sometimes, depending on how well someone's parenting. Right? So that blind faith of their parents, I imitate that with God. Blindly trust him. I well, said, dude, in the last hour and last Sunday morning with the text, all kinds of questions, and I asked you to pursue more questions we had no answers to. I blindly trust God. He is God. I am not. I don't need to know. I trust God. And I tell you what, I sleep a whole lot better at night not needing to know. <laughs> God's got it. I don't worry about it. Makes life a lot easier. 
But that's what a child does with his parents. Also, look at children. They are loyal. They are loyal to, your, to their parents. Have some kids sitting in grade school and somebody talk about their mom or their dad. What are they going to do? You get my mom like that or my dad like that. That's fighting words. You know? They are loyal to their parents. Their parents are their parents and there are no other. And that's the picture. God is my God and there is no other. So when Jesus talks about be humbled like this child, it's not the negative things that we find about acting like a child. It's all those positive, intimate, simple, trusting qualities that children have of their parents and of God for that matter. I don't know any kids that believe in God. They question God in any way whatsoever. They blindly trust God and they happily do so. And I'm to be the same way. And I'll tell you, it's almost 60. I do humbly, blindly trust God and happily do so. I don't need to know the answer to everything. Not even next week's lottery numbers. <laughs> but also with children, they have no worries, do they? You can get nitpicking if you want to, but no. They're not worried in the morning about supper or anything for that matter. It's just happily go along, do what they're going to do. And that's how we are to be. We are to have no worries because God is God and he is our father and he is taking care of us. Uh, so I am to be proactive in being that childlike. Hold myself before God, no worries, knowing my place in God's kingdom is simply to humble myself before him, surrender myself before him. And don't miss that. I don't have to change anything, buy anything, build anything, do anything except humble myself before God. Surrender myself to Him. He makes all the changes. He builds all what needs to be built. He does that. All He asks me to do is trust Him. What a God. Just trust me. Just love me. Just let me be your Father. I'll take care of this. If I do it through you, fine. If you do the work and sweat, fine. But trust me. I am God. I'm your father. I'll take care of this. So it's a great word picture Jesus gives us about how to be great in God's kingdom. So here's the next picture. Who will be great in God's kingdom? Of course, God Jesus is the greatest in God's kingdom. But every other person who is great in his kingdom is the humble little child in his kingdom. So the picture of heaven is no one has authority over somebody else, only Jesus. No one is pursuing to control have authority over, over, over other people. Everybody is simply focused on their love and humility before Jesus and accepting the equality of all people. Can you imagine that? I cannot. Because I live in a world of humans. <laughs> and there is no humbling. There is no idea of equality. I know it's in politics. It's in the news. It's all about we need to be equal. Well, that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo. It's all about how can I control you and get your money or get elected. I can't imagine a place where there are millions of people, or that means they're saved, who all see themselves equally humbled before Jesus. But that is heaven. And that is who the greatest is. So we're all, I guess, in the same boat, equally great. Again, I can't imagine I have a hard time with that picture. So Jesus answers the question, who is greatest, by defining salvation and then defining literally who is greatest. Humble yourself as a child. But then he throws in there children's place before God. And I'm sure he does this because he just said, be like children. And he has their attention. So he wants to emphasize the importance of children to God. And I'm glad he does this because children are extremely important to God. And the text clarifies that. Uh, verse 5. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. The word receive there in Greek usage means to accept. It's a hospitality, hospitality picture. To receive as a hospitality, welcome in, feed, etc., etc. New Testament usage, receive as an emissary of Jesus. Thus, to receive the child in the name of Jesus is to receive Jesus. So every child I come to that I receive in the name of Jesus, it's like I'm receiving Jesus into my presence. Now think for a minute. Every child I come to that I receive in the name of Christ, like I'm receiving Jesus, what a statement of how I am to treat children. Not mine. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> if it's for me, take a message. Yeah. <laughs> it's spam. I'm a lone listener. <laughs> We are to re receive children. We're like we're receiving Jesus. What a statement of how we are to love them and actually humble ourselves for the child. It was like receiving Jesus. I'm not going to be some arrogant, right, dictator to the child. I'm going to approach them in a very humble, loving, submissive way. Not that they're in charge, they rule the day, but the idea is I do lift them up as I would Christ in respect and acknowledging their are are alive, they're a person, and worthy of my respect as a human being. Uh, so, take that word picture now. Would you do or say to a child the same things you would do or say to Jesus? For example, have you ever called a child stupid? Would you call Jesus stupid? A loser, good for nothing. A failure, ugly, fat, you're unwanted. I really don't want to spend time with you. I know you're my kid, but get out of my face. Uh, you know, I've seen and heard all that from parents to kids. Uh, would you do that to Jesus? And that's that's Jesus' point. He talks about the importance of children before God. If you're going to say that to your child, know you're saying that to me. You're treating me that way. Uh, that gets your attention. And you start seeing kids running around and you're in their presence. It makes you a little less likely to just brush them off or literally brush them off <laughs> because to God, they are precious. Very precious. So the point Jesus is making is, look, we are not to disrespect them because they're children. We're not to see them as not life because they're children. And I can't help but think the abortion issue. And they are saying it's not life. They have no rights. They are. They're little ones. They are people. They are humans. And we're killing a million of them a year purely for selfish reasons. But anyway, Jesus is emphasizing their importance before God. And then he goes on, verse 6 through 10. Don't be a stumbling block to these little children. Uh, cause one of these who believe in me to stumble. And my first thought is, how can I cause a child who believes in Jesus to stumble? Easy things come to mind, false teaching, uh, bad language, bad actions. Uh, setting a bad example. If I say I'm a believer in public, and then I go home and, and live a drunken, drug addict, porn addicted person in my home where my kids see that. But what am I giving them? I'm a huge stumbling block. I'm a hypocrite. I'm a liar. I'm a fraud here. And I'm a pervert at home. Uh, there are all kinds of ways I can be a stumbling block. What I watch on TV can be a stumbling block. Music on the radio can be a stumbling block. What I read, magazines, what comes out of my mouth, my thoughts. When Jesus says, don't be a son about the children, that's a pretty huge statement. I need to be aware of every word, every thought, every action, how I dress, what I eat, what I consume. Everything could be a stumbling block to a child. I've got to make sure I keep everything in perspective and set that witness. Because Jesus says, if you're the stumbling block, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck thrown into the sea and drown. Better you're dead than be a stumbling block of children. You know what it says? That's kind of harsh. He goes on. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. Better enter heaven crippled or half or blind than hell as a whole person. And his point is, it's that important about not being a stumbling block to kids. Look at our culture today. It's because the adults taught them that they act the way they act. You can't blame the kid. You can't blame the teenager. You can't blame the 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. Their parents taught them to do what they're doing today. Racism exists. Why? Because their parents taught them to be racist. Kids have no concept of black or white people or Asian or Hispanic. They have no concept. Adults teach them to base or to people according to color of skin or nationality. Kids will teach themselves that. That's all learned behavior. Kids learn to be a Florida fan or a Florida State fan. Great example, is it not? Let them choose what's it going to be, a Penn State fan. I mean, who knows? I mean, literally, let them choose. 
based on the color of the uniform they may choose based on that. You know, not because your mom went to Florida or whatever. But let a kid choose, literally. I like the mascot. That's my team. That's a kid. What kids demonstrate in their thought process and their words and their actions are taught to them by their parents and the adults in their life. And Jesus says, don't be a stumbling block. Better to be dead than be a stumbling block. That's harsh. That's specific. So I'd say he's not kidding. Children are extremely important to God. And in verse 10, uh, their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And i, I got to say, this, this gives me some comfort, but also some questions. Because I look at the world and world events. And, and in Sudan right now, Ethiopia, Sudan I think it is, civil war. Those who suffer the most are the children. When there's hunger, famine, those who suffer the most are the children. In America, those who suffer the most are the unborn children who are being killed. You know? It's the children who have no voice, who have no protection, who have no advocate, who have no one to stand up for them. Their children brush them away. And Jesus says, in heaven, that child's angel continually sees the face of God. That gives me some peace. Those kids aren't abandoned by God. They aren't trash, according to God. They aren't fetal matter, according to God. They are children. They are human beings. They are alive. And God is watching over them. They may suffer here. They may die here. But I believe a child, until he reaches the age of accountability, goes to heaven. Every aborted baby is in heaven. They haven't sinned. How can they be in hell? So I have some comfort here. God is watching over children. Although I see the world around me and say, come on, God. <laughs> but I have to get I blindly trust him. He is God. He's taking care of the children. God loves the children. Verses 10 through 14, uh, he emphasizes that. The parable about the 99. Uh, if he has a hundred and one goes astray, he leaves the 99 to go find the one. And I've always read the parable and thought, well, what about the 99? <laughs> you know, that sounds kind of cold there. He's leaving the 99 to fit for themselves just to find the one. Well, <coughs> since I made it a point to translate all of Matthew this time from Greek to English, have not gone astray is the perfect tense, meaning they are in a permanent state of <coughs> safety when he leaves them. He didn't go out to explain how they're still okay, to pretend that they're safe. He uses the perfect tense to communicate to the reader that the 99 aren't abandoned. They are safely stored away on the mountain where there is no danger of wolf or bear or lion or going astray. They're permanently in a place where they can't go astray, be lost, or be eaten by a wolf. You with me? So the perfect tense there communicates that permanent state of being they have not gone astray. They cannot go astray. They will not go astray. They're safe. So, again, it always bothered me. He abandons 99 to save the one. No, he safely places the 99 here and then does whatever he needs to do to find and save the one. And the context here is, so is the will, so it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. The context is, no child perishes in God's kingdom. He's taking care of all of them. Not one goes unnoticed by him. Not one is abandoned by him. Not one is left to fend for themselves without him. The most important thing is eternity of their soul, and God's got that covered. That gives me some peace, some comfort in a world where kids obviously are throwaway items. They are in America. You're born a million a year. That's throw away items. Thankfully, it's good to know God takes care of them. So I want to end with parents and adults. What does your life, words, and actions teach your children? Are you a stumbling block in any way whatsoever? If you have a problem with alcohol, fix it for your kids see it. It's a stumbling block. Not that if you drink once or now, but the drunkenness is a problem. The problem with anything substance abuse. Fix it for your kids and our stumbling block. If you have a problem with pornography, 
what you watch on TV. Fix it before you can't see what's going on. And you become a stumbling block. God takes this seriously. And God will hold you accountable. For Jesus to say, better to be dead than a stumbling block to a kid who knows Jesus, that's huge. Pay attention. What are we doing? What are we teaching them? What are we communicating? Is there anything in my life that's a stumbling block? If so, cut it out. Literally, remove it from my life, my home, my sphere of influence. So my kids don't see that and stumble. And they walk with Jesus. And I think that'd be a no-brainer. I want my kids to walk with Jesus. So I pray God can evict me of my issue. So I'm not a stumbling block. Let's pray. And Father, I pray you will open our eyes as adults so that we will pay attention to the kids around us and make a point to understand and realize what influence, what example am I setting to this child, whether it's my son or my daughter or my neighbor's son or daughter. I pray, Father, you'll convict us, affirm us, open our eyes to the reality that we are your witnesses, we represent you, and we have an awesome opportunity to be a positive witness to a child, to point them to you, to draw them to you. Strengthen us and encourage us, and I walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.